it's battery efficiency that matters. So where are the inefficiencies in a lead acid battery? Well, there are two primary places where that efficiency is lost. One of them can be considered a coulomb loss. And what's a coulomb loss? Well, that is these ions. Some of these ions do get lost to parasitic reactions. And I do admit that it is very small, but somewhat dependent on the discharge rate and other factors, but not large enough of a dependence for it to have any practical purpose for most people. But there is a Coulomb efficiency to a battery. Different battery chemistries have different base efficiencies. In a typical lead acid battery, this is going to be around 90%, somewhere in the 90% area. And this gets lost no matter what. That's just part of what a battery is. They're not 100% efficient. Some of those ions do get lost. And second is voltage efficiency. And this is a pretty simple concept. Anybody who's familiar with Ohm's law, volts, watts, amps, ohms, uh, these things, this is pretty easy to understand because what happens when you discharge a battery? Well, maybe you discharge it at about 12 volts. So you put in some, so you're removing electrons essentially, moving electrons from the negative post to the positive post, because that's the direction electricity really flows. And there is a path here. You remove some electrons, put them in here, more reactions happen to replenish the electrons, more, you move more over, and you're discharging the battery at about 12 volts. So if you discharge the battery at 12 volts and move one amp worth, one amp hour worth of electrons, because that's essentially what an amp hour is, it's a certain quantity of electrons, we can just think of it that way for this thought experiment, then you have this much energy. 12 volts, one amp, that's 12 watt hours. So you have 12 watt hours of energy that you just removed from your battery. Now if you want to recharge this battery, the Coulomb efficiency is about 90%, so you have to add in 1.1 amp hours of energy into the battery to recharge it. But you can't do it at 12 volts. This is the discharge voltage. You might have to use 14 volts to recharge your battery. And what's 14 times 1.1? Well, it is much greater than 12. And this energy is lost. Now, if you discharge your battery very slowly, it may not discharge at 12 volts. It may discharge at 12 and a half volts, and now you get a higher efficiency. If you discharge your battery very quickly, for example, a starter on a car, this may drop to seven volts and now you get a much lower efficiency. So where does this voltage go? And that's the root of the misconceptions about Peukert's equation. But before we talk about the voltage efficiency of a battery and the internal resistances of batteries, which is really the root of this discussion, I do want to cover a little bit more about the Coulomb or Faraday efficiency of a battery and explain why it really isn't important for this discussion. So let's consider a battery that is fully charged. I'll just take this same drawing of my battery and we'll say that this battery is fully charged and you keep it on a float voltage. Here's the positive terminal. So you keep this positive terminal at, we'll say, 13.8 volts and the negative terminal we'll just define as zero volts. And 13.8 volts is far greater than the natural voltage of this uh, chemical system here. So you end up forcing some current through this battery. So there's always some electrons being forced into this terminal here that already has plenty of electrons. And those somehow have to migrate their way over to the positive terminal. How do they do that? Well, the battery actually outgasses, and that's how they make their way over through this electrolyte. On the positive terminal, it disassociates water, <clears throat> and you get uh, hydrogen gassing off, or, or oxygen, excuse me gassing off of the positive terminal and hydrogen off of the negative terminal. And these then recombine and you get water back in the end. And through this ion transfer mechanism of splitting the water apart and getting positively charged, negatively charged ions, 
they circulate, transfer, recombine, and that's where the current actually goes. It is a parasitic process and it turns into heat. So if you shove one amp through this battery as a float charge, you end up with 13.8 watts of heat being generated in the battery. Now, if you increase this voltage to 16 volts, something like that, well, now you're shoving way more current in here than the electrolyte can support, and it's no longer fully recombinant. This reaction still happens, but the battery warms up because there's a lot more current being pushed through. Maybe it's 5 amps, now it's 16 volts. So your battery gets warm, and some of that oxygen and hydrogen now escapes. You actually see bubbles form, they break the surface, they pressurize the battery, the pressure vent opens, and they're lost. And now we're actually starting to lose some of these ions completely. But otherwise, that's where some of this Coulomb efficiency goes. Processes like that. So let's talk about the Coulomb efficiency of an actual battery. Here I'll just draw a quick graph. And over here I'll just define this as our efficiency on this axis. And on this axis I'm going to say this is state of charge. So over here, I'm going to define as 100% discharged. And over here, I'm going to define this as 100% charged. Here you have a fully charged battery. Here you have a fully discharged battery. And we have a Coulomb efficiency. Over here, I'll define the efficiency as 1, completely efficient. So when you start out with your battery, fully charged, we start out at this point over here. 100% charged and 100% efficient pretty much 100%. Nothing ever is 100%, but for practical purposes, we'll start it there. And you start discharging your battery. Initially, the Coulomb efficiency of your battery is near 100%, and it slowly decreases as you near zero state of charge, because there are more and more of these parasitic reactions taking place. When you recharge a battery, initially, it starts out near 100%. And as it nears full state of charge, it decreases. And this is uh, pretty easy to, uh, to demonstrate on a battery. Because as a battery gets fully charged, it starts accepting current. And it will do that indefinitely, forever. And that current just goes to excess heat. Initially, it's very efficient when it charges. As you near 100% state of charge, you have to back off on your charge current or you can overheat your battery. Simple, straightforward charging procedures that most people that use batteries are familiar with, but they may not be familiar with why that's the case. And this is the case, because they're highly efficient initially, and as they near 100% state of charge, they get very inefficient. And this is where you're losing most of your efficiency, actually in the recharge stage. Uh, if you only charge them to 90%, and fluctuate between 90% state of charge and 70%, the battery would actually be pretty efficient, but that's not a practical way to use the battery because it will be permanently damaged. They do need to be fully charged, so there's nothing you can do to recover that. But this is the Coulomb, or electron, efficiency <coughs> of a lead-acid battery. I'm going to set this aside now and not talk about it again because it isn't really relevant. What is relevant is the internal resistance of a battery. Let me get my paper ready here. So what is the internal resistance of a battery? And that says internal resistance. I'm not the neatest writer when I'm in a hurry. So the internal resistance of a typical battery is maybe about 10 milliohms. And that probably sounds quite low because it is. Lead acid batteries have a very low resistance, that's one of their strong points. But at 10 milliohms at 100 amps, say I want to discharge this battery at 100 amps, that yields a voltage drop of 1 volt. <clears throat> 1 volt is being lost. And this 1 volt goes toward heat in the battery. 1 volt at 100 amps equals 100 watts. 100 watts goes into the battery as heat. Where does that resistance come from? Well, if we go back to the picture of the battery, <clears throat> it's because these chemical reactions have to take place, and the more voltage differential they see from what equilibrium is, the quicker those reactions will happen. So if you pull 100 amps out of the battery, which is a pretty high rate, then it needs more impetus for these reactions to happen. Otherwise, they don't happen fast enough to replenish your electrons. 
Now if you would discharge the battery at 10 amps instead of 100 amps, this exact same battery, exact same state of charge, same temperature, same everything else, all we changed was the discharge current. Now we're only losing 0.1 volts. And the voltage of this battery is now higher. Our losses are one-tenth what they were. <clears throat> so now instead of losing 100 watts, we're losing 10 amps times 0.1, one watt. So you can see that we're losing so much more power here than we are here. And that, that uh, additional energy that is lost, you can now actually recover and do something useful with. And the voltage differential inside the battery is lower because we're giving this electrolyte in here more time for those reactions to take place. They do take place pretty much passively. And uh, they always go toward equilibrium in this battery. They always want a certain number of electrons over here. And uh, they want to have a certain darth of electrons on this side. And if you give them enough time, they'll go back to their equilibrium state. If they're a long ways from equilibrium, it happens very, very rapidly. And as it gets closer and closer to equilibrium, it happens slower and slower and slower. So in my previous video, <clears throat> you probably noticed that I started out with a discharge rate of maybe 80 amps in that battery. And when I took it off of load, the voltage of the battery slowly increased over time. And that's because these reactions continued to happen. The battery continued to discharge after I, I took it off of charge. And these reactions continued to happen until the voltage was built up to equilibrium, and then they stopped. And then I can continue to discharge it at a lower rate and get more energy out of it. And basically, it's just the internal resistance of the battery that's increasing, not your capacity. So let's say that <clears throat> on our hypothetical battery over here, we discharge it one half of the way. So there's a certain amount of ions in here. We use one half of them up. We change those ions into lead sulfate on these plates. The internal resistance of our brand new battery was 10 milliohms. What's the internal resistance of our battery now? Well, it's probably going to be somewhere around 20 milliohms <clears throat> instead of 10. And the reason for that is that there's fewer ions in here. The reactions can't happen nearly as fast as they could before. There's lead sulfate, which is pretty much an insulator on both of these. So there's a lot less surface area to react with. And the resistance of the battery is now higher. So now, once the battery is half charged, if I want to draw 100 amps out of it, what do we end up with? We end up with a 2 volt voltage drop. And that may not be enough to run our inverter in this case. But I could still discharge this battery at 10 amps because 10 amps at 20 milliohms is 0 0.2 volts. And a 0 0.2 volt drop is going to be perfectly adequate to run my inverter. So this is basically just saying that so basically all Pukert was saying in his experiments is he was trying to come up with an empirical equation based on empirical results, not theoretical, to demonstrate how useful a battery's remaining capacity is at various discharge rates. That's basically all he was saying. <clears throat> and you can see here that at a low discharge rate, you can use up more and more of the capacity of the battery because the more of these ions you use up, the fewer there are remaining. And uh, the higher the resistance is, the higher the voltage drop is, etc. There's also a lot of other interesting effects that come from this chemistry being part of the electricity, part of this battery. Uh, this battery does behave a little bit like a capacitor in a way because you have a bunch of electrons here, a lot of missing electrons here, and immediately when you complete the circuit, the battery behaves like a gigantic capacitor and you get an enormous rush of current for a brief period of time until those reactions start taking place and replenish these, uh, these electrons in these terminals. It's also the cause of other strange phenomenon. Uh, I had demonstrated that in my previous video. If you have a battery that's on a float charge, for example, we'll just define this as the float charge and this as the natural equilibrium voltage of that battery. 
it'll start at the float charge and you'll use up some of those excess electrons in the terminals and the chemical processes in the battery aren't really occurring until you get down to this level and then these chemical reactions start happening and what happens is you end up overshooting this slightly and then it'll recover and then it'll discharge in voltage <coughs> over time. So you put a load on the battery, it droops below equilibrium, it recovers slightly, holds for a while, plateaus, and then starts to fall. And that's also part of the same effect. These chemical reactions need time to take place. Now, what determines how quickly chemical reactions happen? Well, how far away the system is from equilibrium is a big factor. And the more current you draw, the further away from equilibrium you bring it. The temperature is a big factor. The internal resistance of your battery will be higher when it's cold, and you can use a conductance meter to, uh, to demonstrate that. Also, these chemical reactions get a lot slower when it's cold, and the battery becomes much more sluggish. And that's uh, going to greatly impact the useful capacity of your battery. But all of these ions are still here, and they're still useful, just maybe not as high, at as high a current as you would like. <clears throat> and there are many other factors that affect this as well. But the point that I'm making in this video is that the amp hour capacity does not depend on load.